I've really enjoyed this morning so far because uh, those pictures of the university from both the previous speakers I thought were fantastic. Um, I particularly liked the one of the campus that Helen showed in the 1930s because um, the period that I've done most on in any Birmingham history has been the late 19th and the early 20th century. And so it really brings home what those people who first put up the university envisaged at what it would be like. And it looks almost, looked almost rural, didn't it? And it brought back many memories to me. Um, I wasn't a student here, although the first time I'm Welsh, as you might pick up from my accent, the first time I ever came into the dangerous Midlands, in fact, um, was a, fr a great friend of mine from Wales had been a student here at Birmingham University in the early 1960s. He was involved with putting on one of the student operas, and um, my uh, boyfriend and myself, my boyfriend who's now been my husband forever, um, <laughs> we came up to see this. And of course the campus did look very different then. And when I started visiting the university in later years, I, I realised that, that things, I hadn't remembered things accurately. And I realised it was more that the university had actually changed a great deal. And just one memory of my own, because I think it leads on to what I'm going to be talking about. I worked in the School of Education for 21 years from um, 1989. And when somebody was retiring in the 1990s, she said that she could remember that when she started as an academic in the School of Education in the 1960s, women staff were not allowed to sit in the staff common room because it was for men. Now, I think she might have, no, it might have been the 1950s. But this appalled all of us. And she said, well, it changed. As I came, they were changing it. But people were still talking about it. And I thought, that is just amazing. You know, already, the research I'd done, um, I, I just thought things had changed by then. So I'm going to be talking about women and gender in history. Um, and it has had many exciting developments in the last few years. And things like that, my memory, your memories, etc., all add to this. Now, what I want to do today, I want to start off by examining briefly why we should do such work and how it illuminates, I believe, not just the lives of women in the past, but the whole of history. <coughs> it also illuminates, I think, how we decide what content is important in the past and what sources we use. I'm going to use one piece of my own research to illustrate this. And I hope it will be useful to you if you're researching gender, women, or any minority group. I know women were never a minority, but they've often been treated as such. But also if you're doing local history or biographical studies. So I hope it will be of some help. So why should we examine gender anyway um, and do it in history? Uh, it's the perception, the perception I think is the main word, of what it is to be male or female in different places and different periods. And the effects this has on the way people live and think. Historians always have been, and perhaps many still are, more interested in men in the past, and they take the male as the norm. The masculine pronoun, which by inference ignores half the population, is often still used in books, non-fiction books, even if the um, people don't intend to actually skew their history so that half the population is left out. Now, for this reason, gender history has mainly concentrated on females, although the moment you start examining what any society thinks about how a female ought to live, you're obviously thinking about how men ought to live as well. And the work of feminist historians in the last three decades has shown gender assumptions as underpinning everything, much of history, implicitly, if not explicitly. I've given that by... Uh, bibliographies, the first part of which has general bibliography, 
And there are many books there which you, um, I hope would be helpful to you if you were exploring this uh, further. All this, um, the, the gender underpinning of history, includes what history is investigated and who is investigated and what source, whose evidence is considered to be valuable. Patriarchal assumptions actually helped the development of many public spaces that seem to have been free of women. I think if you watch any of the, or read any of the stuff that on Tudors that is so predominant these days, you'll realise that women were actually playing quite a part, even if it was just having their heads chopped off. <laughs> but even when women could, began to access higher education and get more employment, those assumptions still often determined what they could do and how far they could go. They couldn't even join in debates about their own nature because women's testimony was not regarded as so valuable. And women were often excluded because they were women, even when they started getting qualifications. This, even though internationally uh, um, historians have realised that gender is not a stable definition. It changes according to where you are and according to what period you, you're in. And it is further dissected, of course, by other things, by class. The experience of an aristocratic woman is not the same as the experience of the poorest woman in society, and there are many gradations in between. It's also dissected by religion, ethnicity, and other societal groupings. Women are not a homogenous group, but they're often talked about as though they are. At the same time, of course, it can be questioned in any society how far women have actually accepted all the assumptions about them, how far they have rejected them, subverted, very good at subversion, um, I think this is one reason why teachers are so good at subversion, because many of them are women, um, rejected it or successfully taken up opportunities to find a niche for themselves where there is an opening. In questioning mainstream knowledge and challenging old interpretations of history, gender historians have not only uncovered many previously hardly thought of or misunderstood areas, but have a deep understanding of all history. I found in my own work on the history of education, history of women, history of science, that um, I constantly had to be looking at debates on issues of power, control and opportunity, which had an impact on everyone's life, male and female. So in asking such questions and reworking old themes from a new perspective, gender historians have had to become scavengers of history trying to find sources wherever possible because actually women leave fewer records than males on the whole. Unless they were royal or a king's mistress <laughs> or a saint, there aren't so many records. Such historians have also been in the vanguard of utilising but modifying philosophical and methodological uh, approaches of others. For example, men like Foucault. <coughs> marvellous to, to use him, but men such as him are prone to ignore the fundamental underpinning of gender in society. Biography particularly has been a very valuable way of doing this because it looks at the lived experience of individuals within the context of their times, um, their social, political, economic, religious context, etc., and they uncover how women negotiated the various pitfalls and problems of the gendered attitudes of their time. So the search is not to try and bring out women as great heroines, we've had enough of the great men of history, but to see them as significant actors in what was going on at the time, to perceive nuances and, and stereotypes and break them down, and recognise the impact of policies and practices, uh, policies in practice. So it's, you know, you say this was the structure of a school. Did that structure allow everybody to progress at the same rate? That type of thing. It can hopefully to reveal the lives of poorer people. Oh, I must say, again, if you're doing biography, there 
the, the richer people are, the more records they often um, leave, and they are more articulate. So biography can perpetuate the skewing of history towards those who can leave records. It certainly gives depth to local studies, which in themselves bring to light the variation and exceptions to national developments. Now, a decade ago, I found this was precisely the case when I did a local case study based on Birmingham and the Midlands to help illuminate the chapter that I was doing on the turn of the 20th century in my book on women in science. I included a short biography um, which Malcolm had prompted me to do for his Millennium Millennium project. That's not very easy to say. Um, He wanted me to write uh, a biography of any woman in Birmingham who was important in science or medicine in the 20th century. I gaily said, fine, yes. And then I thought, I don't know any. (laughs) And it seemed that nobody else did either. Now, from previous research I'd done, I knew that there had been a history of the King Edward High School for Girls, which at the back had some distinguished old girls. You can see I use this. I've written all over my photocopy of it. Um, And this seemed to be the most promising source, and it certainly was. The first five biographies, you can't read them there, but you can see, the first five biographies were all of women who achieved highly in science and medicine. And I hadn't known any of them. And so I chose one of them. I chose the one called Hilda Shufflebotham, because she not only attended a Birmingham school, but graduated at the Birmingham University, practiced as a doctor and a surgeon in Birmingham, and later became the university's first female professor. So, if you look at what it said about her, I was only doing a short biography at the time. I think Malcolm we might remember better than me, but he wanted less than a thousand words. So I was doing a very short biography, and I really wanted to look at the outline of her Mm. life and and use it in the work I was doing on women in medicine. But I do believe that it's doing deep biography that really unpicks the past. And you might consider, if you are, are, are thinking of doing biographical work, how far you'll want to go, because that will depend then on how much research you do, obviously. Now, I found that Hilda, and unlike common practice these days, I am going to call her Hilda. Uh, You'll soon see why. Um, From the time she graduated in 1916, she quickly rose in her professor, and she was particularly interesting because she seemed to contradict all the work that I'd been doing about women in medicine in the first half of the 20th century. Further investigation, however did show a very much more nuanced picture um, of men, medicine, gender and education at that time and in this, this location. So what I want to do here is use my findings to help us think about the very questions that are stimulated by such biographical research. So not doing a straight biography, but actually thinking of the research questions that arise. Now, the school entry is interesting in itself. I blithely used it for several years when I started talking about Hilda Rose, only to discover later that the school's admissions register contradicts the date of Hilda's entry to the school in the book. She entered in January 1903, not 1899. I then went on to discover other wrong dates in the book A wise warning not to rely on institutional histories if you can go back to the actual primary sources and check them yourselves. If you note that here, you see that her name was originally Hilda Shufflebotham. I've often slipped into calling Shufflebottom, which I think she would have hated. Um, uh, But she uh, became Rose, so she must have married. Now, that was an interesting fact in itself, because given her dates, most women at that time, even if they were professional, um, certainly teachers had to, give up work on marriage 
and she obviously didn't. Her married status, however, was a stumbling block, as it often is when you're researching women. I was trying to find out more, but none of the archives in Birmingham, the city, the university or anything, did, had anything on Hilda Rose. And I discovered why. She'd married twice. And for most of her career, she was known as Hilda Lloyd. And once I knew that, I found out a lot more. So under this name, I could discover a great deal more. The next thing I went to were obituaries, usually my first port of call. I do apologise, I cannot think why, but on this particular slide, I could not get all the letters to be the, the same um, size. It just wouldn't do it, so, you know, I gave up. Um, anyway, if you look, uh, I, I use these obituaries, I found them in the Birmingham City Archives, wonderful place to go, sadly now shut until September when the new library opens, and one at the university where Cadbury Research Library, obviously a must for anybody doing um, this type of research here. Um, you can find obituaries in newspapers, local and national, and also the institutions to which people belonged often then write, or, or the grouping, a religious grouping, for example. If you're trying to find out about Quakers, as I was doing some work on various Quakers last year, um, the best thing to do is to go to the, the Quaker journals and find out, you know the date when they died, find out what they're <coughs> saying about them. They're very good at giving you what people thought at the time of somebody's death. They can be very tricky, however. Because generally, when somebody's just died, people only say good things about them. And you have to read very carefully. You know, if they say um, somebody had a strong character, you think, right, people, people didn't cross her <laughs> or him uh, easily. Um, they, uh, religious biases can obtrude, you know. I mean, if somebody is a member of a certain religious sect, it can mean that people either write about them with great admiration because they believe the same thing, or, ooh, you know, <laughs> that person, funny ideas. Um, and other biases can in, in, uh, intrude, including gender. And um, that, that can be quite uh, interesting. All of the obituaries on Hilda spoke of her high intelligence, exceptional professional ability, Brilliant skills as a, a surgeon, energy, good humour, friendliness and generosity of spirit. Although it was from commemoration of her in the Birmingham Post in 1982 by Sally Critzi, in which former students remembered her, that I learned that she was so dynamic, efficient and successful that many of her male colleagues were jealous of her. Yes, that's just showing the Times had one. Um, you can't see all this. I just wanted to give the idea, you know, that, um, of, of who was actually writing about her. This was very interesting, the non-stop life of Lady Dynamo, because it was much more about her as a person. Whereas in the Times, in the medical colleges, etc., they were interested in her professional life only. Um, so that was interesting. Now, from this, I could now build up a timeline. And whenever I do research on a person or an institution or whatever, I always try as early as possible to try and build up a timeline because dates are important. You can get things horribly wrong if you say, oh, you know, so-and-so was interested in such and such a thing and you're talking about them in the 1930s when they could not have had that idea until the 1950s. You know, you've got to get things right, obviously. Anyway, I built up a timeline and I have to say that this timeline is not the one I built up. Um, it's been very much amended. Only last week I amended one date in it. Web resources that are available to me now that weren't, even in 1999-2000, have revealed, have, have helped me to see things which I didn't see then. Ancestry.co.uk, if you can afford to belong to it, and I, I, 2000, um, I, I, I wasn't a, mem a member then, it has helped me discover mistakes, including in some respectable resources. 
For instance, Hilda's death notice in the Times said that she was born in 1892. The 1901 census, and you won't be able to read these, you'll have to accept it, I'm afraid, from me. The 1901 census said 1893. The 1911 census said um, 1892. In fact, her birth and death certificates prove that she was actually born in 1891. <laughs> so there's a number of respectable sources there, the Times, two censuses, who all got the date of her birth wrong. So as I say, you do have to check as much as possible. Similarly, a number of obituaries and the new entry on Hilda in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, which again, I think for biographical um, research is an absolute must and if you're a student of the university you can access it at the university for free. Um, they said that Hilda married Baron Rose in 1949 or even later. The England and Wales marriage index show that they actually married late 1948. I mean you, can, you can't register the marriage before it happens can you? <laughs> Now, I found this very interesting because her first husband died in January 1948. She married again in December 1948. But all her official histories say 1949. Are they a bit worried of this woman marrying again too soon? I don't know. Uh, Curtsy had pointed out that Hilda did not waste time with journalists and even refused when the university, uh, when uh, she was professor there, asked her to write her CV. She refused. And you have to remember that history actually knows more about people if they actually leave evidence for history. Hilda's ex-students spoke very, very highly of her teaching. Her obituaries remarked on her becoming the first woman professor at Birmingham. While King Edward's biography said that the medical school had a bust of her by no less than Jacob Epstein. <laughs> When I was first doing my research, 1999-2000, I couldn't find it. I went to the medical school, that wonderful building, and it was there in the foyer, but in such a dark corner that you couldn't see it. It has now, only when the medical school had a new wing, and people, including myself, have been making a fuss, um, it is now very prominent in the medical school. And um, it's even referred to proudly on the university website when it's talking about its art um, uh, and uh, archaeological collections. There was a plaque for her early on the um, women's hospital where she uh, worked. Um, there's also now a blue plaque to her on the medical school, which has come fairly recently. Now, these developments have moved far from the time in 2001 when I addressed um, the History of Medicine Society here, uh, national meeting here at Birmingham, and I queried um, why Hilda Lloyd Rose, whichever you want to call her, why, she, why was it that she was barely recognised by her own university? In the history of the university, <coughs> written in 1947, the two authors, one mention of Hilda, simply said that Mrs. Bertram Lloyd was appointed to the chair of midwifery in 1943, being incidentally the first woman to hold a professorship in this faculty. Yet she became the first whole-time professor of obstetrics and gynaecology in the university. An amazing distinction for anybody. In the history of the university published in 2000, she is not mentioned at all. Nor is she in most histories of the city. It seems even now you cannot rely on official histories if you're looking for the women. It is very significant which people are honoured on sites and in official histories. The silences and blanks often tell us a great deal about perceptions of women at the of people at the time, because many men are left out as well. A pertinent example of this I found was it was only in the Curtsy article um, that it was mentioned that she and her husband retired early in 1953 
because they were against the new National Health Service, because they believe that doctors should um, make their money from those who could afford to pay them and treat everybody else for free. And yet, so I read this and I thought, oh, that's an aspect of her I didn't know. And yet, at the same time, I've also now found out that um, Hilda actually worked for the NHS. Um, she was a member of the maternity committee of the regional NHS board. She was on the advisory board of the Royal College of Nursing. So it's obviously an area where I still need to find out more. Was she for or was she against? Or was it a nuanced picture where there was something she disliked? I know she thought later on in life that doctors were becoming too mercenary and all that they thought about was money. How people are portrayed is also very uh, significant, and we have to think about it. If we think of the images used in Hilda's obituaries, the Birmingham Post chose a picture of a kindly, matronly woman. When Josephine Barnes, herself an eminent obstetrician and first ever female president of the British Medical Association, did an obituary, she chose the picture of Hilda in her academic robes and also made sure that all her letters, there's a whole string of them, appeared after the title. So if you look at the two together, you're given a different image of what this woman was like. Portraiture is a very significant and often totally undervalued source in history. And um, in the last decade, there have been several exhibitions, uh, particularly on women, uh, there was one in London in 2008 on brilliant women. It was on the 18th century. Uh, the book came out. But all of them have showed that portraits must be deconstructed, as all archives must be, not just seen as illustrations. Um, I've chosen one because it's a favourite one of mine, although it's nothing to do with Hilda Rose in one way. Um, this is a picture of, of um, Mary Somerville, who was a very, very famous mathematician and scientific writer of, of, in the 19th century called the Queen of Sciences. This was a picture done of her when she was 54. And they were very anxious. The, the person who did the portrait was um, very anxious to make her look like a pretty young woman, not a 50, the image that people might have of a 54-year-old uh, mathematician in those days. So, portraiture is important, but so are mental images. They can perpetuate cultural and social concept in which gender is implicit. When I first spoke about Hilda Rose to a medical audience, including some elderly participants who'd known her, I was hoping that I was going to get some really illuminating comments back. First one I got was, do you know, when she became eminent, she bought her own Rolls Royce. <laughs> and I thought, well, this must be just male amazement at the fact that a woman would do such a thing. But subsequently, I've read Carol Diehouse's very illuminating article on driving ambitions, where she discovered that in the 1930s, um, uh, uh, she discovered from the life histories that were extant of women uh, around them in that unconventional minority of ambitious women who managed to enter the highly masculine world of, of medicine, there are many anecdotes of them lo loving powerful cars. And Dai has muses on this sort of unfeminine desire to sort of take control of a powerful vehicle. As, as a correlating with their struggle against the odds, and uh, a struggle in which many of them actually ultimately failed, especially in the bleak years from the late 20s to the 30s. So it was significant after all. So how did Hilda manage to do so well then in the first place, if there was all this difficulty? Now in the first place she was lucky in her own circumstances and location, and context is all. Her father was a prosperous grocer in Birmingham and was able and willing to afford one of the best local schools for his daughter. And she was also a foundation scholar. She therefore had social capital and through going to get one of the few girls to get the really good education of the day, 
um, she got cultural capital as well. She attended King Edward uh, VI High School for Girls, which was one of the first, in fact, it was the second secondary school for girls in Birmingham, which under its head, Edith Creek, earned an outstanding reputation for its science education, unusual in girls' schools and even many boys' schools at the time. The two excellent science teachers, Miss Davison and Miss Slater, had, like the headmistress, been very early students at Newnham College, Cambridge. From the 1890s, the school had been sufficiently innovative to um, use the first-rate facilities and expertise of Mason Science College, which we've already seen pictures of. I have to add here, I only got this particular picture on Monday. I happened to go to a lecture in the Cabri Research Library on Monday, and I saw this picture up on the wall. I thought, well, that wasn't here the last time I came. So, of course, being me, I, I go and ask. And I was told that uh, recently, I mean, Helen probably knows a great deal more about this, some old boxes have been, um, that, with storage things in have been opened, and, and they found this picture <coughs> and put it up on the wall. So I said, oh, can I take, can I take a picture? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll use it for something I'm speaking on later. And there it is, and it's a rather fine picture. So you have to go to the Cabaret Research Library to see it. Um, now, these developments of the school using Mason Science College um, led to many um, uh, exhibitions and scholarships, one in, in education, um, usually to Cambridge. King Edward VI had ties with Newnham College and many of their students who went on to university went there. By 1914, four former pupils had been elected to the Biochemical Society. That was so unusual for any woman, four from one school. Uh, one of them, William Cullis, was a Sidgwick scholar at Newnham, was to become chair of physiology at the London School of Medicine, professor emeritus of physiology at the University of London, and amongst other titles, president of the British Social Hygiene Council. All the woman, women I looked at from King Edward's were amongst the first in Britain to reach such positions in science. Thus, although generally in the whole country there were very few role models for women, students at school, looking at women in science or medicine, Hilda attended a school where both staff and contemporaries were actually forging such roles, together with the female intellectual networks they were building up. Since the late 19th century, Birmingham had had two high schools for girls, the endowed King Edwards and the independent Edgbaston High School, which also unusually emphasised science for girls. One of the latter's ex-students was the Quaker Mary Sturge, the second permanent woman, woman doctor at the Birmingham and Midland Hospital for Women in which lay women of the town's elite, especially Unitarians and Quakers, and other leading liberal families, played a leading role since its establishment in 1871, as they did in the establishment of the two girls' schools and the university. So if you look at the founders of all those, there's a high proportion of Quakers and Unitarians, although, of course, they were a very small proportion of the population, but they were now the elite in Birmingham. And these were the very groups that I knew from my many years' research to be in the vanguard of progressive views on women's rights and position. Um, and in actually doing this work, it was adding to the educational and biographical research that I was doing, which was opening up a whole area of informal community of women, uh, civic, educational, scientific, medical and social role, um, of these women that was so important in the history of this city at that time. These schools, however, were only open to a small proportion of the population. And although more opportunities for girls grew at the, as the slowly increasing number of schools established by the new uh, Birmingham City Council, for girls, science appeared not to be at a premium. I found that in Birmingham generally, Scientific opportunities increased for boys and young men at a much faster rate and in the more prestigious sciences. Science for girls, as on a national level, 
was much more likely to be hygiene plus domestic science, even for some of the middle class. Um, this shows the importance of thinking of how fields of knowledge can be gendered. Nevertheless, these subjects did lead, of course, to the growing number of jobs in nursing and childcare. Um, in addition, in Birmingham, certainly from the 1930s, there were courses run at the technical college, colleges which led to qualifications in pharmacy, which at the assistance level particularly were taken largely by women. Now, I've, I've got all this record of, of the, um, the exam results of the technical colleges over a number of years. This is the best page for what I was looking for, because it's the only page on which women appear in large numbers, unless you look at the business courses or the domestic science courses. And here, all the bits that I put in yellow, I'm trying to highlight that women were taking various qualifications in the 1930s. And Birmingham was way ahead from the late 19th century, right up until this time, Birmingham led the country in the number of women pharmacists it had. So, there was education growing for girls, and it was given things, but, but we're, girls never kept up with the numbers of boys at any class of society, and education was very much divided by class. Even at the elite girls' high schools, biology became the main science subject, but on a level which allowed university entrance, usually Oxford or Cambridge. In 1910, however, Hilda entered the local university, which had been open since 1900, a university ostensibly emphasising science and technology, and the first university, yes, sorry, and the first British university to be on paper at least equally open to women as well as men. So Birmingham again, she's in a place where Birmingham is ahead. Medicine was the most prestigious section of the fledgling university, having developed from one of the first medical schools and purposely built teaching hospitals outside of London, and already having secured an excellent reputation. With regard to women, the records show that, despite the support for women's suffrage and higher education of the first university principal, the highly reputed physicist Oliver Lodge, complete equality was hardly the case in reality. In medicine too, in the 1930s even, when Hilda was a practising doctor in Birmingham, the views of the internationally renowned 19th century Birmingham surgeon and gynaecologist Lawson Tate were reprinted in the Birmingham Medical Review. So this is the 1930s, he actually said these uh, words much, much earlier, back in the 1890s. Um, but they're reprinted, which is quite significant. I think it must be admitted that the average female brain and its secretions are inferior to the average male. But this, he said, was no argument for keeping the profession of medicine closed to the few competent women, the very few, he added. The number of women who entered who would enter our profession would be a mere drop in the medical bucket. And as they would be the pick of their kind, they would undoubtedly be useful to us. So I think this is another reminder, it's useful to know the context. I'm talking about Hilda and, and she's succeeding, but these are the type of things that are being said by very eminent people or reprinted at the time. Nevertheless, in 1900, the University of Birmingham was one of only four university medical schools in England outside London which admitted women. All medical classes became open to them by the second session as women demonstrators and assistants were appointed to teach them, particularly in those aspects of medicine such as anatomy, gynaecology, midwifery and rape which the male medical staff thought in, inappropriate to discuss in mixed company. There were special provisions for them. For example, women had a separate entrance to the chemistry theatre to ensure that they sat behind the men. And there were no facilities for female staff. Nobody has told me how women managed all day. By facilities, they obviously meant toilets and washing facilities, but anyway. 
But gradually, the reticence of some of the tutors was overcome. Women did have equal access to clinical practice, and their numbers grew. The Dean's Register of Students, part of the excellent university records to be found in the Cadbury Research Library, over the years 1900 to 1920, show that of 156 female students, 41.6% were from Birmingham itself, with another 32.1% from the Midlands. So nearly 74% of the female medical students were from the city and its neighbours. In the early years especially, some students took um, special particular courses, but from the beginning, most of them qualified as doctors albeit in the early years particularly, some finished their degrees in London or Edinburgh. Uh, when Birmingham first started, those people who wanted a good degree would do an external degree at London or go up to Edinburgh for a medical degree, which you could do on the strength, you, took, you could take the exams without having actually studied there. Um, which led to some difficulties. <clears throat> Altogether, women were about 25% of those graduating in medicine, numbers increasing during the First World War, although they were to fall later. Fifteen of the students, as you can see, gained a diploma in public health, ten of them in addition to qualifying as a doctor, while some others simply took the courses. Some students continued into pharmacy, public health or surgery, or chose nursing, midwifery or dentistry. These, this was very appropriate for a time when medical services of all kinds were growing, particularly in education and in the budgeting area of public health. In Birmingham, the two subcommittees of hygiene and special schools of the Education Committee and their records, the records of the Education Committee, which you can see both in the university uh, archives and the city archives, very, very interesting. Those subcommittees of hygiene and special schools were the ones that principally appointed doctors and other med medical staff to work with various school children. They were also the subcommittees that had most women on them. Mainly female members of the elite nonconformist families, eager to appoint women nurses, doctors and even dentists to the ever-expanding school medical service. Um, Dame Elizabeth Cadbury, as she became, um, is an example of such a woman. And the City of Birmingham Education Committee minutes offer most of the evidence. And I've just got a few slides. You won't be able to read them very well, but just to show... The Hygiene Subcommittee in 1936-37, uh, to 37, it has a chair, man, who is a woman, um, but it has, once you've got past the aldermen and the councillors, you've got Mrs L. Cadbury and um, various others. I, it always fascinates me because if you know anything, particularly about the, the Quaker and the Unitarian families, you begin to recognise the names. Um, and then, if you look at the assistant school medical officers, Quite a few women there. So um, it's, it's very interesting. Um, health provision, I was just, that's just to give you some idea of the type of things that were now coming under education. And in the special school subcommittee of that same year, again, a woman chair, and women, um, quite a few women on the, the subcommittee. So, looking at these women who went into medicine, it's a very good record. Birmingham had a very good record at that particular time. On the limited evidence available, I mean, I found some, but I, I really, if I go into this more, I'd need to look for more. It seems that many of them worked in Birmingham and the West Midlands, and a fair proportion of them were graduates from Birmingham. There were certainly more women doctors practising in this area than they would expect at the time. But it was only in the First World War that the numbers really increased, and that, of course, when men were away on active service. In 1916 to 17, they were 40% of the entry and filled many of the hospital residency posts. Coming back to Hilda, this is precisely when she was first appointed to the Birmingham Hospital for Women. Um, it's not clear, therefore, how far she would have succeeded if it hadn't been for the chance of war because other women found opportunities in the war, but lost them afterwards. 
Nevertheless, Birmingham did appear to offer women greater possibilities in medicine than in other places in England, even in London, where the immense problems, both over gaining university admission and obtaining clinical practice, worsened in the 1920s. In 1925, only about 300 women held honorary staff positions in hospitals in the whole of Britain, and these were rarely the more prestigious charity-aided voluntary hospitals. Hilda's appointment to the Birmingham and Midland Hospital and then to the Birmingham Maternity Hospital, therefore, mark her as untypical nationally. But the Birmingham and Midland had been unusual from the 1870s in its early appointment of women doctors. The first two permanent such women were Dr Annie Clark and then her cousin Mary Sturge. Established in 1871, principally by men and women from Birmingham's new liberal elite, the hospital was highly uncommon, in, both in the control it gave to lay governors and in constitutionally saying that half of the committee management always had to be women. Hilda Shufflebotham worked there from 1916, becoming honorary acting surgeon in January 1920. The location of actually being in Birmingham, therefore, at this time, was supremely important. And any of you doing research, think about where people are and how that helps or hinders them. It was under Mary Sturge's influence, whom I showed you before, that Hilda became a founding member of the Medical Women's Federation, MWF, established in 1917. She was proud of this connection with a somewhat controversial body which was working hard for justice for all medical women, achieving some success on equal pay and showing the necessity of having medical women who could advise the state properly on matters such as infant welfare, venereal disease and birth control, but rather less success on removing the marriage bar. Hilda personally believed that women should be allowed to keep their jobs when they, were when they got married or became mothers. She did much to promote contraception, and remember the period, and to help the lives of mothers, and became a vice president of the Family Planning Association. When the Medical Women's Federation presented Hilda with a portrait of herself to commemorate her successes, she said this was the greatest pleasure of her professional life. And she was already a Dane by this time, but she counted this one more. She was keen to advance women in medicine, although she did not want special concessions for them. With Alice Bloomfield, she founded the Women's Visiting Gynaecological Club in 1936. Interesting that it was only for women, and it was only for those who were fellows of the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecologists, and there were very few of them at the time. It does seem she was keen on forming communities of women, professionals, but it was into the field of obstetrics, gynaecology and paediatrics that she principally encouraged them. The area where she'd risen, but also the traditional area of medicine for women, where they could be sidelined. sidelined. You know, if, if you go into medicine, you're a woman, you could always be pushed in one direction. On the other hand, this was where Hilda made her mark. Her brilliance in both public and private and public practice being further distinguished by her pioneering of the Birmingham Obstetrical Flying Squad, which saved the lives of many women and children. She took the first emergency call herself on the first, in the middle of the night. And it was through such achievements that she became the first woman to be president of a Royal College of Medicine that of obstetricians and gynaecologists. She was also the first Birmingham graduate to be president of a royal college. It was in this area, indeed, that many women medics found their niche, especially as we've seen in the rapidly expanding area of public service. In Birmingham, the few other women employed in the hospitals and women doctors in private practice were part of a local medical educative community eagerly attending meetings of the various local medical institutions, as reported in the monthly Birmingham Medical Review, of which Hilda was an editor from 1930. Women medics, including Hilda, participated in research, hers largely based on clinical observation and practice, 
and review the work of others. Um, I'm just going to finish now, um, I've got to my conclusion anyway, but I would like to point out that many, much of the research that women did were in the areas I've been talking about. And so Hilda's air, whole career was undoubtedly aided by being in this community. I want to point out one last source that I had um, on Hilda before I make my concluding remarks, and that is that um, a good source came to me from somebody who had been a trainee nurse, 1944 to 50, who worked with Hilda Lloyd, as she then was, um, at the Birmingham General Hospital. Marion Roberts remembers Hilda as tall, kindly, quietly spoken, and teach, treating patients and staff alike with courtesy and concern. She also recalls that when the news of her impending marriage to Baron Rose became known, the hospital was agog, and tongues wagged continuously about this strange coupling. It was like chalk and cheese. He was such a bluff, black country man. Things like that, these very comments, can help to your research. So in conclusion, I hope I've pointed out a few of the problems um, and pitfalls, as well as the things you can do in biographical research. For me, doing such research has certainly opened up lots of areas in history and given it me new meaning. And it, it has helped me to go further in stuff. It's helped me to see the work of other types of historians, geographical, art, literary historians, and appreciate more the range of sources and approaches you can use, but also the multifaceted lives of people. People aren't just a doctor or a wife or whatever. They are many things at the same time. And I think one of the best ways you can learn about interdisciplinary studies is actually to go to the many things that Malcolm sets up. He sets up he's such a leading role in having these days when lots of things come together. And I hope that you will find that if you do consider using, looking at gender, that it will open up areas of history for you. Thank you. Thank you.